Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the service. If you will, stand, please. And let's sing number 262. 262 in our hymn book. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone. For eternity Once I was lost in sin's degradation Jesus came down to bring me salvation Lifted me up from sorrow and shame Now I belong to Him Now I belong to Jesus Jesus belongs to me Not for the I'm alone, but for eternity, joy floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me, his precious blood he gave to redeem, now I belong to him, now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to Amen. We're going to remain standing, have prayer together, but we want to welcome you today to a very special day at our church. It's our old-fashioned homecoming Sunday, and we're looking forward to a great day. Uh, yesterday, we had a wonderful breakfast. Our church folks gathered in, carried in a great breakfast, and uh, Dr. Carter was there and shared with us his testimony of salvation and how God's used his life to touch the lives of so many others and encouraged and, uh, and challenged me to be involved and being sure every day I try to do something to share the gospel, invite someone to Sunday school and church because we have such a short period of time to live and labor for the Lord. And so it was just a great morning. We're looking forward to a good day today. We'll have <clears throat> this uh, combined Sunday school time, our morning service, our evening service will be at 6 o'clock. But right after our morning service, we want to be sure to invite everybody to stay for lunch. And uh, they've been carrying food in over there for an hour, and uh, I've been helping them. I've been going out to the car and carrying stuff in. And uh, if you notice what looks like a finger hole in things, it's not really what it is. And I do have clean hands. I've washed them every time I've done it. I mean, uh, I try to keep them clean. But uh, we're having a great, great meal uh, after the service, and we want to invite everybody to stay for that, and we're looking forward to a great day, and uh, we're going to pray together, and then we'll just uh, go ahead and begin, but Father, we thank you for the grace that you've bestowed upon our lives. God, we are undeserving people, um, yet Lord, you loved us, and God, you uh, have demonstrated your love for us. You came into the world, and uh, Lord, you lived a sinless life and died on the cross with our sin death. Lord, uh, you were willing to be separated from the Father so that we could live forever with Him. And so, Lord, we need you today. And we're thankful, Father, for what you've done uh, for all men, women, boys, and girls. And, Lord, we pray today that you'll just bless this day. God, may it be an encouraging day. Well, we pray today that, God, if there's folks who've come to church but have never come to Christ, that, Lord, they would look to you and be saved. Well, we prayed for our people, those that know the Lord, that, God, today you would just encourage us, equip us, challenge us. And, Lord, may you have our lives so that each day we might, Lord, do something, God, for you. That we might live for what you were willing to die for so that, God, when we come to the end of life, we'll have made a difference that we lived. So, Lord, we just commit all this to you today. and We'll thank you for what you're going to do. ask you to bless our speaker today. And use him, and God, we just thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated. We appreciate everybody being here. And again, it's just a great day for us. 
everybody is welcome to stay for lunch and don't worry about having brought anything or not. We just want you to stay and be a part of that and uh, that'll be a blessing. Tonight at six o'clock we'll have our regular services and Dr. Carter will be back to preach for us and uh, we're praying. I know he's invited a lot of special visitors to the services and uh, we've been uh, as well trying to do that. I know that you have also, so we're just looking forward to a great evening tonight. And uh, that'll, that'll be something we want you to be praying about all throughout the day. But uh, how many of you have ever, have never met or heard Dr. Ed Carter? Would you just hold your hand up for a second? Okay, thank you. Put it, you can put them down. Dr. Ed Carter, just a tremendous uh, friend. I, I'm so thankful for him. But uh, he has a, a very... Uh, tightly knit uh, history with our community. Dr. Carter was on the 1970 Marshall football team and uh, the plane that crashed that killed everyone on board, he was one of those few ball players that was not on the plane. And so uh, God had his hand on his life and uh, well, yesterday morning he shared his testimony and uh, uh, we're so thankful that just a few years after that, the Lord saved him and called him into the ministry. He's been preaching God's word, and uh, God uses him in a powerful way all around our country and around the world. And uh, so we're just thankful to have him here with us to preach to us. And uh, so we've asked him just to take our Sunday school hour and share what the Lord's laid on his heart for this moment. And then this morning he'll be preaching in the service and tonight as well. Be praying for tomorrow night. We're going to be going over to Marshall University tomorrow evening and working along with the FCA. And we're going to have a meeting over there at 8.30 tomorrow night. And uh, it's going to be in the Henderson Center. That's the basketball court. And uh, uh, Dr. Carr is going to be able to share uh, his testimony, preach, and uh, they're working hard to get as many student athletes in that meeting as possible and as many lost people as they can. And we're praying that'll be a great night tomorrow night. And so be praying about that for us. But we're going to get him to come and he can just share what the Lord's laying on his heart this morning. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Amen. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm sure glad to be with you for this special occasion of your homecoming. And I've been able to make some visits over to Huntington, trying to find people that I've known. And I did get some of them. One of them is my former coach, Red Dawson. Red came before I did, but uh, we were here together and he told me he's going to his church this morning, but he plans on coming tonight. So pray that God will touch his heart and that he will come because I've invited him many times but he's never shown up, and so I pray that he will come, and there are others that we're expecting to come as well. I want you to turn your Bible this morning to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, chapter 6. As you turn to Ephesians, chapter 6, when I got up this morning, I read my, I got four devotional books, I read those, and I read my chapters in the Old Testament. Instead of going into the fitness center, I just took out walking. It may not have been a safe thing to do, but down 52. It was dark, and the walking outfit I have on is a green Marshall University. Faded out green as on top of that, too. And a cap someone sent me called the, the Destiny, the Dynasty. Years of Randy Moss and... Also, Byron Leftwich and Chad Pennington and some of those. So I did go walk, and I came back, met a man in the uh, area where we eat, and he is over in Guyandot preaching revival. And so I shared my testimony with him. There was a grandmother and four grandchildren sitting at the table. So I was trying to figure out how I could witness to them. And so the grandmother said she's from Beckley, and I began to share my testimony with her. She knew about the plane crash. And Pastor, I had some of those little uh, tracks with the Marshall football team on the front of it. And so I gave the kids, four of them, my track with my picture of my team on it. And the grandmother said the kids had to be taken back to Charleston so they could go to church. And then she was taking a couple with her up to Beckley to go there. 
So they see the picture of the team, of course, but inside is the gospel. And I'm praying that if they aren't saved, they'll know the Lord. Then the lady that's preparing the food, I didn't remember her, but she said, you talked to me the last time, preacher. And I said, well, I, I didn't remember, but I'm t talking to you again. So I gave her a track. Does Jesus really care? And that's what it's all about, telling people about the Lord. And if you've never established that habit, I want to encourage you. You ladies, put them in your purse. Men, put them in your pocket. And everywhere you go, I just do it this way. I pray before I give them out. And then I say to the person, here, let me give you some good news for the day. And a lot of times I've had people say, boy, I need some good news. And they take the track. And God knows if they ever trust the Lord. But someone gave me a track 40 years ago. I cannot remember who did, but somebody did. I read the gospel track. And of course, I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And now I've been preaching in March 40 years because somebody cared. Someone obeyed the Lord and witnessed to me, and the Holy Spirit did the rest, and I was saved. And so that's something that you want to begin doing. You, you young people, you can put tracks in your pocket, give them out to your classmates, your friends, your relatives. Uh, you ladies, you can give them out to your girlfriends, and gentlemen, you can give them out to your co-workers. Time's running out, and the trumpet is going to sound at any moment. Of course, when that trumpet sounds, those who've heard the gospel and who've rejected Christ, they're never, ever, ever going to get another chance to be saved. So we need to reach as many as we can before time runs out. Ephesians 6, I want you to notice these verses. Verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. You'd want to circle those words, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against, circle these words, the wiles of the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, underline that, against powers, underline that, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. That's the second time we've seen that statement. Take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able, and this time he says, withstand. Earlier he said to stand. This time he says to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to what? Stand three times. And then verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And he says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Father, thank you for this precious time you've given us. I pray that it will be a time that will be profitable. Make me a blessing, I pray. Speak to me and then speak through me as I share your word. It is in Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. The title of this lesson is The Spiritual Warfare. Or we could subtitle it, The Warrior's Resources. Now let me hasten to say that once you trusted Christ, you became a member of God's army. Paul says it. He says we are a member of God's army, and we want to please the one who has chosen us to serve him. We're in his army. And so when we talk about the resources of the Christian soldier and the spiritual warfare, there are three enemies that we are in contention with every day, and I give them to you. Number one is the world. The world is our external foe. And then number two is the flesh. The flesh is our internal foe. And then number three, the devil. Satan is our internal 
infernal foe. So we have these three enemies that we're in contention with every single day. And most days I'll say, Lord, I know that the battle is getting ready to begin right now. As soon as I wake up and get out of the bed. And, but thank God there's victory over these enemies. Amen. The world, 1 John 4, 4 and 5, 4 says, This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And we sing that song, faith is the victory. Remember that? Faith is the victory over the world. Well, then what about our flesh? There is therefore now no more condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us the enablement to be victorious over our flesh. And then what about the devil? We're no match for the devil, and thank God God never told us to fight him or defeat him. For the Bible says in Revelation 12, 10, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus has defeated Satan that day at Calvary. He, he, he defeated him. He's going to finish him off. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. He shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So there is victory over these enemies. But at the same time, until the Lord comes to get us, we're in a battle. I got seen right across the river in Huntington. And I was so ignorant of the word and the Christian life that I didn't know that Though I was saved, I could still sin, Pastor. I didn't know it. Boy, I was excited. I'm saved and on my way to heaven. And then finally, the crunch time came. And some of those old habits that I uh, was guilty of began to haunt me. And I began to struggle. Wasn't called to preach yet, but I was saved. I knew that. And I tell you, I was struggling. I was in Texas with my mother who was dying of cancer. I never will forget it. And I was struggling so bad that I asked God to kill me. Aren't you glad that God doesn't answer all of our prayers? He hears them. God didn't kill me. But he sent me back to Huntington. And when I got to the Souls for Christ Baptist Church that is now called River Cities Community, I always was on the front row with these young fellows and the young uh, lady is. And you know, my friend... I wasn't spiritual. I got on the front row because I was always having to go down to the altar. By the way, never be afraid or ashamed to go to the altar. I know a song, that's what this old altar is for. And God used that song in 95 at Highland Park Baptist Church. And we listened, when that preacher got through preaching, we were there till midnight. They darkened the lights and people were getting baptized and then the lights came on another group was down there and God used that invitation on this old altar. I got down there on the front row because it's scary coming from the back of a church. Now, I know what it's like. I'm not always standing up here. And so being on that front row allowed me to just fall out of my seat right down on the altar, down on my knees. And I was down there quite often. God didn't kill me, but he brought me back home and he put me under my pastor. Listen to your pastor. There were two people when I got saved that became my best friends, my pastor and my Sunday school teacher. I took notes. I still have those notes from way back there in 1974 when I got saved. I have them in a box. I wrote down everything I could hear. And God helped me to get victory in my life over many of those things that plagued me. Then God put me with a man named Art Hank. And Art said, brother, you need to make a prayer list. That's the way Art talks, real slow. He said, write them down, and when Jesus answers, you can check them off. And I did. And God began to answer my prayers. But to be honest about it, there are some things that I still have to battle with after almost 40 years. Some things I have to deal with. But every day, I trust the Lord to enable me to be victorious. These resources that God, well listen at this, the Christian in his walk invariably engages the opposition of spiritual resistance of the devil and his hosts. As spirit-filled warrior, he must continually be strong and strengthen himself with the armor provided for him. The ground of the warrior's strength is his position in the Lord. His strength 
is the power of his might. When the Christian takes account of his position in Christ and appropriates the provided armor, the Holy Spirit empowers him to make good the new life in resisting satanic attack. And you know, the Bible tells us to resist the devil. To resist the devil. And in Ephesians 6, 13 through 20, the warrior's use of the resources that God has given him are described under the figure of a Roman soldier and his equipment. Now you got to remember, Paul was chained to a Roman soldier in those prison epistles. And I guarantee you each time that shift changed and a new Roman soldier came, he was thinking, oh no, I'm going to be chained up to this preacher for eight hours. And I got to listen to him talk about Jesus and write letters about Christ. And I, I guarantee you they weren't excited about being changed up to Paul. And instead of Paul being in prison, the soldiers were in prison because they had to listen to a spirit-filled man of God as he preached and as he wrote. And so Ephesians 6, 13 through 20 gives us these resources. The believer's resources are described under the figure of a Roman soldier's equipment in full battle dress. His secret of victory in spiritual battle is reckoning or counting by faith those resources which are actual in his Christian life. You know, the Christian life is a life of faith. And in Romans 6, the Bible says, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed under sin. And so the first thing I want you to notice in this series of verses is the preliminary instructions. It is an emphatic, you be strong in the Lord. You be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Friends, we do not have to be walking around wimping out and afraid of our own, sh our own shadow. God tells us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I have no strength. But God is my strength. And this verse says be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. I'm so glad this morning to remind you that our God is all powerful. All power emanates in him. And we're seated with him in heavenly places. We are co-laborers in Christ. We are joint heirs with him. And the power that he has is ours. The problem is many believers never avail themselves. Boys and girls never avail themselves. Teenagers never avail themselves to the precious resource of the power of God. He's all powerful. The Bible says you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then the Lord Jesus said in the gospel, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power of the authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We have power in the Lord Jesus Christ. You put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. You know that the Christian warfare is a warfare wherein the warrior is never to retreat. We're never to be going backward. Yet many a believer finds himself or herself going backward. You can only go one or two ways, forward or backward. There is no neutrality. There is no middle ground. You're either going forward or backward. Which one are you? Are you going forward or are you going backward? You say, what do you mean that you're now to be going backward? When you see these pieces of the armor, you will see that there's no part of the armor to cover the back of the soldier. And the reason is we're never to be going backward. We're to be going forward. And by the way, I just read it the other day in my devotional booklet. We are in a posture of victory. The victory is already won. And all God asks us to do is to stand. To stand and to withstand. In the Old Testament, the Bible says God looked for a man to stand in the gap. But he found none. We're living in a day and time where you can't find anybody that will take a stand for the Lord. I had a preacher sent me an email from Canada. He said, me and you graduated back in 81 from Temple Baptist Seminary in the college. 
He said, I remember you back there and you took a strong stand for the Lord. Are you still taking a stand for the Lord? And I said to him, my son did it. I don't email. I said, Mark, email him back and tell him, I know I'm not taking the same stand. I'm taking a stronger stand now than I did then. I'm taking a strong stand for the Lord. I've been called old school. I've been called a hard nosed. I've been called all kinds of derogatory terms. And all I'm simply doing is standing on the promises of the Lord. I do not plan to go backward. I do not plan to whip out. I'm taking my stand for the Lord. So he tells us to put on the whole armor of the God. Then number two, I want to see you to see the profile of your enemy. Because he says this, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know, if our enemy, most of us men, you know, we are taught to be macho and so forth. But if most of our enemies was another guy, I'll be 63 in November. But I still think I got a little bit in me that I could do something with a guy. I think I could. My wife says, honey, they don't do this anymore. But anybody that wants to be fair about the thing, I I don't have a gun, never had one. Well, that might be foolish thinking. But I want to tell you, my friend, there was a man in the Old Testament named Caleb. And Caleb and Joshua and Moses saw the people of God march around in the circle for 40 years. And 40 years later, Caleb is now 85, and Caleb said, Give me this mountain. I'm as strong now to go out as I was back then. And God gave us the victory back then, and I believe he can still give it to us now. God hasn't changed. And I know a lot of the men that many of you have heard that have gone to be with the Lord. God has raised us up, Pastor, to take up the mantle and to stand. And so he tells us about our enemy. Number one, it's not a fleshly enemy. We can't even see him. Now, I've never seen the devil, but when I was a kid, the artist painted characters of the devil. He had horns, and he had red eyes, and he had a tail and a pitchfork. And when sinners slid down the chute into hell, he prodded them in their rear with his pitchfork and taunted them for coming to hell. No, that's not the devil. You want to know what the devil is like? You read Ezekiel chapter 28. And you read Isaiah chapter 14. Ezekiel 28 says he was beautiful. He was full of wisdom. And he tells all of these things about the devil, nothing that even resembles what silly men say the devil is. We can't see him, but he's there. The devil's real. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our enemy is invisible. And then here are his soldiers. First of all, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but look at the against principalities. You get a chance, get yourself a good commentary and look up these soldiers of the devil. But the first group are called principalities. And then against powers, that's the second division. And then against the rulers of the darkness of this world, that's the third division, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. We call these demons, imps. The devil has his forces. Now the devil can't be everywhere at one time like the Lord, but these demons help him make it appear that he's everywhere at one time just like the Lord. But he's not. But his myriad of fallen angels are everywhere. Some of them, no doubt, were so diabolical that God in Jude and 2 Peter has placed them under the earth in chains of darkness waiting for the judgment of Almighty God. By the way, God's going to release those imps during the tribulation. They're going to wreak havoc on this planet. But those who are left here are doing a thorough job of confounding believers and causing havoc on planet earth. Halloween is coming up pretty soon. When I was a kid, it was just a fun thing. Get your bag from the grocery store and go collect candy. We didn't know that this is the devil's highest. Listen, the highest celebration of the devil is Halloween. That is the time that we have been told that more sacrifices of humans are done during that night. Make no mistake about it, witches are real. 
Warlocks are real. They have satanic power. Our sons never went trick-or-treating. We didn't let them go. For a lot of reasons. One of them is they're putting razor blades in the fruit. Kit bites down on the apple and, and then poison things. We didn't let our boys go. And some churches have what they call trunk or treat. And it's just a variation of trick or treat, but they're trying to keep them off the streets and the church gives them the candy and so forth. But you'll see a kid's picture on the side of an 18-wheeler. Have you seen me? No. Nobody has seen that child because a lot of the times the devil and his people have gotten that child and sacrificed him or her. Halloween's a wicked, ungodly celebration. And we never taught our boys to fool around with it or have anything to do with it. You want to do it, you go ahead. But we didn't let our kids fool around with Halloween. Uh, he says these groups of uh, demons have one goal in mind, to wreck our lives. They want to wreck our lives. They want to wreck little boys' lives and little girls' lives and teenagers and young adults and Older believers. And listen, notice he says this earlier, and I, look, I went over it, uh, the wiles of the devil. That word wiles means his cunning craftiness, his tricks. The devil has all kinds of tricks that he pulls on mortals. And don't think that, well, I, I can outdo and outwit the devil. He started in the garden with Adam and Eve, and he caused them to fall. And you know, he's got a lot of experience now. He's been tripping up men and women for all of these thousands of years. You're no match for the devil. So don't even think about it. The wiles are the cunning trickery of the devil. Then he goes on to say, Spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, we've seen our enemy. We've seen the preliminary instructions, but I want you to notice, put on your armor, your equipment. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. This is an evil day in which we live. Make no mistake about it. There's a group called... Americans for freedom against religion. You know what I think ought to happen to them? They need to give them a one-way ticket to Russia or somewhere where there is no freedom of religion. These wicked, ungodly people want to enjoy the benefits of being an American, but yet kick out the very thing that made this country. I have no respect for those who call themselves uh, the ones who are for freedom from religion. This country was started on biblical principles. And don't get me started on the ACLU, another diabolical, ungodly organization. They're always on the wrong side of whatever is good and right. they got a lot of money behind them, and they terrorize and frighten believers who don't have the resources to fight against them. You can call David Gibbs at CLA, and there are some other groups like his that will go to court with you and for you and fight against these God-haters. But they're out there. And so he says, put on your equipment. Number one, he says, take unto you the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand. And God wants us to stand, to withstand. And so he tells us about these parts of the equipment we're to put on. And the first thing he tells us is to put on, notice this, your loins girt about with truth. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And when he tells us to have our loins girt about with truth, uh, actually he's telling us to put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the truth. And then he says this, not only having your loins girt about with truth, but look at this, having on the breastplate of righteousness. That breastplate surrounded the soldier's vital organs, and we are to have on the breastplate of righteousness. And ladies and gentlemen, young people, we have no righteousness except that which was declared on our behalf through our reception of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because the Bible says all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. Thank God we can put on the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then he says, having, look at this, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The good news of peace with God produces firm-footed stability when we're fighting against the devil and the demons of hell and his attacks. And then he says, above all, take the shield of faith. The shield of faith is interesting. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And faith is a resource that every one of us has plenty of if we will just use it. You know, that shield, it was an instrument that was placed out in front of the Christian soldier. And when the darts were fired, they didn't touch the soldier. They landed in the shield, the shield. And we have the shield of faith. And when Satan sends his fiery darts of doubt and discouragement and despair, and on and on we can go, they will never touch us if we'll lift up the shield of faith. And those fiery darts will end up going in that shield of faith that God has given us. But he said something else. He said, uh, take the shield of faith where we shall, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And look at this, take the helmet of salvation. The image of God was marred in man when Adam fell in the garden. But it wasn't totally destroyed. And what helps us to correspond with a God who is infinitely wise is we're created in his image. And how is that so? Because there are three things in man that corresponds with God. Intellect, will, and emotion. Intellect, God is an intelligent being. Will, God has a will. Intellect, will, and emotion. God can be grieved, he can be quenched. And that is the same thing that makes up a mortal. Intellect will, and emotion. We are created in the image of God. And so he says here, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to acquire fiery darts of the wicked. The helmet of salvation, my friends, covers the brain. Satan's number one attack is our mind. And this spiritual warfare that we're engaged in is, is, listen, primarily engaged in fault right here in our skull. Out on the street, they say, if he can get in your head. If he can get in your head. And that's why the Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds. You've been having trouble with your thoughts. You've let your guard down. And if you let your guard down, Satan likes to get in your head. And if he can get in your head, he's got you on your way backward. He'll, listen, put doubts in your mind and other things that go with doubt. So he says you must take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation constitute protecting the vital organs which have to do, my friends, with the thought life in our spiritual sense. And then he says take the sword of the Spirit. This is the only offensive weapon which the Spirit provides. It's the Word of God. Amen. And you know when the Lord Jesus was tempted, the Bible says, number one, he was sent out into the wilderness or led there by the Holy Spirit. And then in the gospel, Satan came and tempted him. And on every case, the Lord Jesus quoted the Scripture. I would advise you, my friend, to memorize Scripture verses. I've tried to memorize scripture verses for every situation I find myself in. Memorize the word, boys, young people. Hide it in your heart. Because there may come times you don't have an actual Bible or a New Testament in your hand. But you need to have God's word in your heart. So that when Satan and his demons try to tempt you, you can recall a promise from God's word. And God will give you the victory every time. He did for the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word provides the power that we need. The personal knowledge there is used by the Holy Spirit, both offensively and defensively. 
Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. And then he says this, the heaven of salvation, the, uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the... But here, listen, you can have all of these pieces of equipment, but if you do not do what verse 18 says, they're just worthless pieces of junk, so to speak. If they won't work, if you do not do what verse 18 says, and verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. These pieces of spiritual armor are great, but if we do not season them with prayer, we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. We're going to fall flat on our faces. Friends, you ought to establish a time of prayer. My time, my best time is early in the morning. And so I start my day off praying before I read my Bible, my devotional booklets. Then I read my Bible and my devotional booklets. And when I take off walking down 52, uh, you better believe I'm praying because some 18 wheelers come whizzing by too. It's dark. And I'm praying, Lord, keep these cars and trucks on 52 and don't let them veer off and run into me. I probably better stay off 52 because it's, it's dark and some of them may, you just never know what might happen. I want you to know that prayer is the capstone of the believer's armor and that it is to be uninterrupted activity. It is the ram that the armor the Lord Jesus has provided is appropriated to the immediate conflict being waged against the devil. We must pray and ask the Lord to energize those pieces of equipment he has given us. This is a rhetorical question as I close. Have you found yourself in a battle? And you know, a lot of believers, when they get into spiritual warfare who don't know what the Bible says, they think God's angry at them why is this happening? They listen to that, uh, that cable channel with Jan Crouch and Paul Crouch, and they tell you everything is going to be rosy, and life is a bowl of cherries. That's not true. The Christian life is the most difficult life in all the world. But I wouldn't change it for anything. I love being a Christian. I welcome those battles because God has lessons for us to learn as we go through the battles the most important lesson to be learned as we go through spiritual warfare is that I'm not alone. I'm not by myself. The Lord is with me. Therefore, I can claim the victory. I'm victorious in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And when I fall, I can cry out to the Lord in repentance and faith and trust him to the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down. Uh, boys and girls, you might fall. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you might fall. But the Lord Jesus will lift you up and put you back in the battle for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen the admonition, the preliminary instructions, and we've also seen, secondly, what he tells us about the devil's cohorts, and then thirdly, the equipment that he has provided for us. I'd encourage you to become familiar with this passage of Scripture. Go over it and let it indelibly be imprinted upon your heart for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus' sake because I'm telling you from 40 years of experience, this warfare is never going to cease until Jesus comes. So you may as well just tell the Lord, I know that there is a spiritual battle being waged, and I'm going to trust you for the victory. I want you to bow your heads with me now, and I want you to close your eyes. How many of you this morning would say, Preach, I, I really hadn't thought of it the way that you explained it, but I understand now I'm in a battle. I'm in a battle. And to be honest about it, Preacher, I've been losing. I've been losing. Because I have not been appropriating what God has provided for me to experience victory. How many would admit it this morning? You, you, you say, I'm in a battle, preacher. But I've been struggling. I've been struggling with habits. I've been struggling with my thought life. I've been struggling in areas of my life. I've been living a defeated life. 
I mean, would honestly admit it. You're in the Lord's house now. I've been struggling, preacher. And as a matter of fact, I've been living a defeated Christian life. Pray for me, preacher, that I would appropriate what God has given me to experience the victory. Father, I pray that as the pastor comes, you guide and direct in the hearts and lives of your people. Just before he does come, though, you know, you might say, Preacher, I know why I've been experiencing defeat. I'm not saved. I'm not a Christian. Preacher, pray for me that I'll get saved. Pray that I'll let Jesus come into my heart to be my Savior. If you've never trusted Christ to be your Savior, but you say, that's what I want to do, lift your hand up and just put it right back down, that's all. Lift it up, I will see it, and I will pray for you to trust Christ as your Savior. Lift your hand up if you'd like to be saved. All right, put it down. If you lifted your hand, look up at me. Look right up at me if you lifted your hand. Just look right up at me if you lifted your hand. I did see a young man lift his hand up. Son, look up at me. Would you like for us to take the Bible and show you how to be saved? Will you let us do it? Get out of your seat right now. That's it. Get up. The pastor will give a person to come to you. They will take the Bible and show you how to be saved. Father, I pray that as the pastor comes, you would guide and direct. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Carter. And, uh, we're excited about the, uh, the Sunday school hour, the great message and uh, the most important thing we can do with God's Word when we hear it is respond to it in our heart and just say yes to the Lord. And so we're thankful for the great message. Uh, we're going to go ahead then and take a short break. We'll start our Sunday morning services here in just a few moments. But uh, we've got some folks coming in the back, so if we want to go ahead and open those doors up and let folks in. We have restrooms right out through those doors or right through this doorway as well. So if you need a restroom break, be sure to help yourself there down e outside of either exit and uh, you'll find them. But we'll be starting.